Hey, Justin. Hi. Hello. Hey, Stephen, how's it going? Good. I've got a competing uh, appointment coming up here in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So I'll be able to at least listen to both or listen to part of this one before we uh, have to jump on the other one. Yeah, no problem. Um, Hey, Tom. Steven. How are you? Good. Looks like um, we only have two people on, which uh, is okay, because you'll get to ask your questions. And, uh, oh, here we go. Here's James. Let's wait a minute or two. Hey, James. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm doing great. Thanks. Great. Let's wait a minute, see if anyone else shows up. Or they have everything nailed and they don't have any questions, which is also fine. That means that I... I Oh, Kevin. Okay, Kevin is a little late. Okay. Um, so, um, wait a minute till 11.04, and then we'll lay into this puppy dog. So, I'm pumping out some more chapters, guys. Okay? There's going to be another one. After the one I, uh, I sent you this morning, uh, I sent you two new ones. Uh, th this one's going to be called Swing Prison. <laughs> Pick yourself. <laughs> All right, let's, we can start. So um, nice to see you guys. And um, anybody have any questions or comments, fire away. So uh, I'll, I'll get started. I played a couple of times last week out of this uh, lockdown situation. And uh, the first day, it wasn't like great, but I, because I maybe I was too aware of things and, you know, trying to process too much and uh, get a little better as I went along. But the second day, I had some. Uh, some very good results. So in other words, I, 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 I go by this, uh, there's a website called GameForge. And GameForge means that, uh, has this one stat where if you can hit the ball inside 20 feet, it's called a birdie chance. So in other words, how many chances you give yourself is very important. That's very so My second day, I said, okay, I'm just going to fool around with a couple of things. And I'm just going to, my perception was how many times can I, Am I going to hit it inside 20 feet? And basically, the second day I did it seven times. And I hadn't done it seven times in a long, long time. So it was, it was based on a couple of things. One, my perception was that I was going to allow myself to do it. So I'm, I'm said, and I was going to accept whatever the figures were because I had no idea what they would be. So unless you sort of in a sense keep track of yourself you don't know what is really happening so I'm getting a little bit into 
not stats, but just paying attention to things after they happen. But the main thing was my perception going in, the acceptance, and then uh, the going back over it at the end of the round and just seeing what was available to me. And, and, it, and it felt pretty good. It felt pretty freeing. And there wasn't any pressure to do it again. It was like almost I was surprised that I did it again. And I was surprised, and I didn't count up until the end that I had done it seven times. So it was interesting to sort of set something out there and then let it go. So that's, that was my goal, was to set something up there and then just let it go and then see what I came up with. Okay, so... Um, um... You were using level of acceptance, right? Yeah, that's my big thing is I, I can actually play freer now because I can accept things. It's the number one thing. So what was the difference in how the swing felt versus how it normally feels? It felt like I wasn't as involved as much. I wasn't uh, sitting and looking down like I was in a drone looking down over myself and criticizing or calculating what to do. It was almost like, okay, I won't know until the end what's going to happen, so go ahead and just do it. So there was more of that just do it type of feeling and attitude of, and, and the funny thing is, I knew before I hit the shot that the shot was going to be pretty good. Not all the time, but a greater period of the time where I just felt comfortable. And I don't know whether that's because I was allowing things to happen or accepting or whatever, I just felt a little bit more comfort in the sense that, okay, I felt, as you would say, more whole. So that's a very good experience, Tom. And, and, and I think that's what um, most golfers are looking for. Um, and, and how much more freedom did you have in your swing than you normally had? The same 10% more, 20, 30? Well, here, 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 here's what it is. When I, uh, when I play, I drive the ball in every fairway. I never lose the ball. I can go out with one ball and play golf. I'm never going to hit the ball off the fairways. So the funny thing is, there's an, a, a great deal of acceptance there already. I never think about that, you see? But I'm not, a, I was a poor iron player. So for me to get seven chances inside 20 feet was like, that was a big accomplishment for me. I never do that. I'm lucky if I hit eight or nine or 10 grains. But I hit 13 and I had seven chances. So my iron game was more on for some reason. It's just, I don't know what it was exactly. I couldn't define it right away, but it just felt like it was just easier to do what I wanted to do if I just the, left it alone. So, uh, and how much more freedom did you, did you have with your irons than what you normally experience? Oh, a lot more because I, it was more that, uh, my my visualization of the shot was like I can do this instead of worrying about it. It was more of an acceptance of the fact that I can do this. Let's see what happens. Um, so it, if you were going to give it a percentage, ten percent more, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. I would say it's up in the thirty percent. Okay, good, good. So congratulations, it's a great experience. Um, and uh, when you walk off the course. Um, you feel much better about your round when you have that kind of experience, even if you did make a lot of putts and you gave, but you gave yourself a lot of chances. So, you know, there's a few foundations of the program that, you know, it's almost like the foundation of a house when you're building a house. And um, if you don't have a solid foundation, it doesn't matter, you know, what else you do, it, it could be shaky down the road with, you know, with the structure of your house. And one of the main foundations, and I, I think there are actually two foundations of the program. One of the main foundations is that muscle memory doesn't break down, which is an, an enormous paradigm shifting universe to live in. Because if you live in the other universe, which is I have to reinvent the wheel on every shot, I have to make sure because after all, when I don't swing well, my hands are not in this position, so I have to make sure my hands are in this position. And you start to micromanage more and more of the swing, which is the corollary of 
uh, muscle memory doesn't break down. Well, muscle memory does break down, okay? And I have to reinvent it. I have to reinvent it on this shot. That is a very, very um, uh, challenging world to live in because every shot, there's a lot of drama. So what you did, Tom, is, is you accepted the fact, okay, I know how to swing. I've hit thousands of balls. I'm just going to trust it. And I'm going to accept the result, which um, puts you in, in the universe of, okay, the money's in the bank. And I'm going to accept whatever I get. The one universe is the money is in the bank. The second universe is I'm going to accept whatever, whatever I get. Now, you know, it's interesting accepting whatever you get. Why in the world would you accept missing the green, okay? You would never accept it. But as I mentioned in the book, is that even when you accept the ball going right or left or long or short, you're always going to default to the DNA goal. It, it's, it, it's like even when you're thinking a million things in your mind, you're always going to default to staying on the road unless you really go crazy upstairs. So when that happens is what shows up is, oh, a solid swing. That's what shows up, not a not solid swing. You never not, a, you never not want to swing well or, or hit your target or hit it solid or have good tempo or have good balance or get in certain positions. That's, those are all DNA goals eventually. So what you did is you started living in the whatever universe, which is counterintuitive, especially for a professional athlete. The whatever universe is – all right. Second ball syndrome, whatever. It's, it's, it's a very innocent universe. There's not too much focus. There's not too much concentration. There's not too much determination. It's all right, whatever. Now, to live in a whatever universe as a professional golfer is extraordinarily challenging. You know, and I was watching a little of the, of the, of the, um, of the golf, the live golf on TV, and yesterday, and you can almost see when they were not living in the whatever universe, okay? I mean, I saw one, I didn't, I didn't watch it for too much. I, I was working on the book, but I saw one long um, par three, and um, what's his name? Uh, Ricky Fowler, he just pulled a dead left. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible shot. I mean, he really missed the green. And that, that could not have been the whatever universe. It's, I'm on TV, I'm playing with three good guys, two superstars, one emerging really good player. I want to hit a good shot. I want to hit a good shot. That is not the whatever universe. So it doesn't matter if it's, if it's Rory or if it's Ricky or if it's Jack or it's Tiger. It doesn't matter at all because the dynamics that control the subtle processes in the mind are the same dynamics for every person on this planet. And, and unless you honor that, unless you really honor that, then um, it, it's Vegas, baby. It really, really is Vegas. So that experience you had, Tom, is absolutely what, do you wanna have that experience every time um, you're on the course? Oh, yeah. Yes. It's okay. It's, uh, yeah, I can see because I can live with that because the expectation is lowered a little bit. And, and I'm just dealing more with, I, I'm changing my perception beforehand. And that's what I'm working with. Um, I have a bunch of students and we've, we have this plan going where they have this perception and they perceive themselves being a certain way. And they act it out. It's almost like they're in a movie and they, they have to play this role no matter what. They get mad. They get upset. They don't get upset. They laugh about it. They swear. They, and it's always basically the same response. And they just have, it's, it, it's in their system that that's the way they have to respond. And right. they are not aware of it. So I played with a fellow the other day who I've known for uh, 60 years. We grew up together 
and uh, we've been playing golf for 60 years together. And I said, Paul, basically, I said, you set yourself up for these things because you're almost like acting a role. This is the way Paul acts. This is what he says after he hits the shot. This is what he says to deflect criticism. This is what he says to do that. This is what he says. So it's almost like I said, you will do this three, four, five times during the round, maybe more. So every time you start to do it, I'm going to catch you and I'm going to show you what you do. Just so you're aware of it because you're not aware of it. He wasn't aware of it. That everybody, when they hit a poor shot, tells a story to deflect what they think went wrong instead of just accepting it and going on. It has to be, in his mind, a story. I, I moved ahead of it. I did this. I did that. I did that. It's got to be a physical cue that went wrong. Yeah, acceptance is very powerful. It's the most difficult thing. You know, in tennis, in tennis is much easier. Any other sport where you get many, many chances, it's much easier. Golf, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. One shot, one swing can ruin the round or, you know, what would have happened if, what's his name? Scott Hope made that putt for the mat and the Masters, okay? Who missed, what happened if, if uh, Doug Sanders made that putt in the British Open? Their whole career changes. So it, it, it's not an easy thing at all. Now, Tom, why don't you, because I don't think people know much about, you know, who's talking, who's listening, but Tom, just give a brief background on, on your resume uh, and talk about yourself for a second, okay? So people know where, where you're coming from. Okay. Uh, I was a very, very good junior golfer. Very good. Played Massachusetts. Very good junior golfer. Went to Brahmins College down there in uh, Florida. Played four years. Was it All-American Division I, uh, Division Two down there. We won national championship, finished second another year. So we had a very good team. And basically, we didn't have a coach to speak of after the first year. And I become, because there were five freshmen that came off the team after I was a sophomore and they were all freshmen, I became the de facto coach. So in essence, I would look out for them. And they trusted me with the golf swings because the golf, swing, a golf coach didn't know anything to speak of. He was just a taxi driver, so to speak. So I get in that, the business way back then. And I tried to play for years and uh, had some success, a lot of up and down, got in the business of um, love to work with people, like people, uh, like to teach. So I got in that business and I happened to get a lucky break. I went to work for um, Craig Harmon up at Oak Hill in 1978. And I worked for Craig and uh, through that friendship and the people I met at Oak Hill, I caddied on tour for a couple of years for one of the members at Oak Hill, Terry Deal, who played on tour. So I went out from January through April and would go back to work in May and caddy for Terry. So I caddied on the pro tour and I would watch these players. I was inside the ropes. I could sit on anywhere I wanted to on the practice tee. And I used to go watch Trevino practice all the time and Norman and um, Faldo and Watson, all those guys back then. They all done uh, Trevino loved an audience, so he, he loved it when I came and sat down and he'd just talk and talk and talk. Then I went to work for Dick Harmon at Rib Rogues, Craig's brother, and I, I got to know Claude very well. And uh, just got to know a lot of people in the golf business and people who were great teachers. And I went to and took lessons from 20, 30 great teachers Jack Grout, Bob Toski. Johnny Revolta, you name it, Jim Flick. Uh, I became the pro at Oyster Harbors. And uh, down the street in New Seabury, they used to do the golf digest schools. And those guys had come over to play Oyster Harbors afterwards. And I got to play with Davis Love's dad a couple of times, talked to him. And then I just progressed and uh, took a couple of jobs up around Boston because I wanted to get in more of the metropolitan area rather than being on Cape Cod. And I decided in, in 2000 with some friends who I talked into it to building the Harmon Club, which is a teaching learning facility, nine holes, regulation holes, nine short holes, a gym, five bay learning center, large range, uh, short game areas to help people learn how to play golf. And that's what I've been doing the last 20 years.
So Tom is one of the most uh, respected teaching professionals uh, in New England. So, um, you know, his resume is, is pretty thick. Let's put it that way. So I thought it would be interesting if you guys knew a little bit about the person that's talking. So thanks, Tom. But I'll, I'll give you one instance of, of, of uh, and I'm this, this is not to say anything good or bad about the person, but when I went and worked for Craig, Claude would be there quite a bit. And Claude was the number one guy, teacher. And he loved everybody to play a fade. And I played a high draw. He didn't like that. So he would constantly tell me, uh, you can't talk to a hook, a fade will listen, a hook won't, can't talk to a hook. So he'd, he'd have me try and fade the ball all the time. And it was there that I lost my sense of control over my own game. I gave it to somebody else. And I gave it, I, I started to give it away. So that's what I think people do. They, they, they give it away and they start to think that they don't have a say or a, a place in the game the way they should. And I gave that up for many years, my sense of it depended on somebody else's opinion. And what I try and talk to people about now is, no, this is your game. This is how we're going to do it. And all that matters is the way you think for yourself. All I do is guide. I make suggestions, whether you use them or not, that's up to you. My job is to just guide you and, and be there when you need somebody to talk to and, and help out. Well, that's a very powerful story and that's a very powerful statement saying giving your uh, game away to somebody and um, that that has ruined a lot of careers a lot I can think of three right off the bat but um, yeah thanks for sharing that I may include something like that in this in this next um, next chapter that I write I may ask you some questions it, I think it's very important because People tend to do that. They, they, they play well when they're with you and, it's, and they think it's you doing it. Right. They never think it's them doing it when they're hitting a good shot. So when they leave you or leave that situation, they don't have the trust or the confidence to carry on on their own. So, and then what happens is that because they're playing for somebody else to impress someone else, then in pressure situations, a lot of time fear shows up fear because they want to make you know they really love and respect their coach they don't want to let the coach down because the feeling could be now it's not all the time in some cases that if i don't play well it means that um my coach is not a good coach and i want people to feel that my coach is a good coach so i want to play well so people have a good feeling about him and they don't think that he's a bad coach because Everyone knows I'm seeing him, and if I don't do well, uh, you know, they could, um, they could blame the coach. I mean, that's a conversation on a very deep, dark, not such a dark level, but on a deeper level. And, um, you know, I mean, I could relate to it, you know, taking lessons when I was a kid. You know, I want to I show everyone that I have a good coach. I don't want to let him down. And then as soon as... as, soon as you start playing for somebody else, then you're in trouble because there'll be a block in accessing uh, deeper levels of silence in the mind. Anybody else want to? Uh, yeah, Steve, I have, a, I have a few questions, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, in particular, what I was hoping to hash out with you, I was hoping to be on the call last week, and I apologize to others if, I, if I'm holding you guys back a little bit, but... It's the, 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 the question of target attachment. And I was hoping if I could take a few of your minutes, you know, just to kind of take me through a little bit of your intentions with that statement. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, well, I'll give you guys an analogy. And again, guys, I'm sorry if this is boring, you guys or whatever, but I, I wanted to have this conversation with Steve. So bear with me. And I think we'll all bear some fruit from it, to be honest. But uh, Steve, I, I was luck I'm lucky enough to have a lot of kids. And um, as a result, I've also changed a lot of diapers. And my wife, who uh, if I threw a tennis ball to, would uh, probably break her nose, um, is an amazing diaper thrower. She can open up a garage door and take a diaper and throw it across the garage into the basket, like over and over and over. It's amazing, actually. And yet, if I gave her a tennis ball and said throw it to my glove, no chance, right? 
So I wanted to lay that foundation first. And then interestingly, she and I have discussed this and I've coming from where I do in terms of as a mental game coach, quote unquote, you know, uh, I have a, I have a reverence for the target and for connecting my breath to that target and for being aware of the thing outside of me that my energy is guided towards. And my argument with her was that, yes, well, with a sweaty diaper in your hand, you have an amazing target attachment, quote unquote. But I'm wondering how you might explain, you know, the diaper toss, as it were, in terms of more of a fluid motion factor, as opposed to an external awareness, let's say, in my world. Now, you did give me a bit of an out, and I'm wondering if, you, if you're speaking in very absolute terms, of course, which of course means you know, we interpret things because of the concrete nature of words, and, and maybe you meant something a little bit more abstract in it. For instance, you gave me a little bit there with the tuning fork, which allows me to attach to a target as a tuning fork, as it were, for my fluid motion. Um, but I'm interested, to, if you don't mind, I, I, w- I was interested to sort of sit back and listen to you tell me about why am I so good at throwing snowball? I'm sorry, guys, I'm from the north, throwing snowballs at stop signs and hitting them all the time and throwing diapers across the room and somehow getting them into the basket all the time. So uh, first of all, how many children do you have? I've got four kids. They were all under four, though, for a little while. So yeah, it was that, quite a production. Yeah. Keep your attention during the day. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to ask yourself what is happening when someone hits a solid shot and it goes right to the target? What are the dynamics? Well, there can only be one set of dynamics. There can't be one set of dynamics for you when, um, or your wife, when she's just nailing, you know, those diapers or you're throwing a, a softball at a sign, I mean, a, a snowball at a sign, and another set of dynamics for the person who's doing the same thing. And I would answer it uh, two parts, um, two kinds of dynamics going on. The first dynamic is that the target is always part of the smoothie. It, it, it has to be part of the smoothie, because if it's not part of the smoothie, um, in your mind, you know, you're, there's going to be some doubt. So the target is part of the smoothie. Now, so is um, um, swinging well. That's also part of the smoothie. So is uh, getting the club in a certain position. That's also part of the smoothie. So is the, the, the quality of the lie that you have or the temperature or the wind or where you are in the round. All of that is part of the smoothie. Now, if any part starts pulsating, it doesn't matter what it is, it's going to break wholeness. So when someone does throw a snowball at a stop sign or a sign or whatever at a target and hits the target, it's not like the target disappeared. It's just that whole, you just made a really good smoothie. Now, with that being said, what about swing thoughts? Because there's a lot of players that have good swing thoughts that have a lot of swing thoughts, okay, every time they hit a ball. Nicholas, Lee Jansen, a lot of guys on tour. Bryson DeChambeau, okay, he's writing some kind of book on each shot, right? And he's he's still able to execute. What is going on there? What is going on there is a very refined, and this is why um, it can't be a blanket statement that you never think about the target, okay? because there's some players that do think about the target and they're very good players. Now, how can that be? Aren't you breaking wholeness? No. What you're doing is a very rare talent that really separates the great players. And that is what I call the ability to think in the transcendent. Hey, thanks for joining me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's this? Oh, no, no, no. Somebody on the outside, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So, um, so it's, what I, it's a very rare ability, John. It's called thinking in the transcendent. And I call, when you access the deeper levels of the mind, you can call that tran- the transcendent. Now, mm-hmm. when you can do this, and the great ones could do this, and that's why Nicholas, Nicholas's mm-hmm. career uh, was uh, one of the reasons why is that he was able to do it. And what it is, is the ability to put your attention specifically on something in the smoothie without breaking wholeness. 
You don't break homes. And that's the only way that really you can successfully execute a swing thought. Now, that is a rare ability. It takes a very, very refined nervous system, almost a stress-free athletic nervous system to be able to do that. And then saying that, you have something in the opposite direction of Tiger saying, I took the club out of the bag. I didn't remember anything until I saw the ball land on the green. Now, I guarantee you that Tiger creates a very sophisticated algorithm. You know, you've seen that commercial uh, where he's talking about, now I have this shot. Now, should I, ha uh, should I hit it with my right hand? Uh, should I play the ball back? Should I play it forward? Should I have a 10-finger grip? Should I flop it? Should I do this? So he's got so many choices every shot that he hits, especially, you know, around the green. And so he, he puts together an algorithm that's a very sophisticated algorithm because he has more choices of what he can successfully do with that ball than um, just about any golfer. This is Tiger in his prime. He had so many choices. So he was able to execute. Now, it could be there, there, there are two kinds of experiences he could have had. I'm just, hype, uh, you know, hypothetically speaking, but I think one experience is that I took the club out of the bag and I didn't remember anything. And the other experience is maybe one, maybe two, maybe three very specific elements of that algorithm he had his attention on in the softest, he's, he's, he's putting his attention in the transcendent, he's thinking in the transcendent, where I really want to make sure, it's like, um, I'll tell you what it's like, it's like that fabulous chip he did at Augusta on 17, okay, that really nailed the deal, that he, and I think he was saying, I want to make sure I get my right hand, it was something that he wanted to do very specific, or the putt, when he won the Masters on 17, sure, he was getting his right hand um, somehow dominating more with his right hand. Now, his attention was on that because that's how he discussed it at the end. But because he's the athletic genius that he is, he was able to put his attention on something extremely specific in that algorithm, in that smoothie, but it didn't disrupt. The, uh, experiencing everything in terms of wholeness. So to answer your question, John, if someone says, well, I don't, you know, I don't buy into that, Steve, because I'm thinking about the target. I have to think about the target because if I don't think about the target, my swing is not going to, it's not going to turn out the way I want it to turn out. I'm saying fine. Now there could be two instances where, you, where one is you're successful and one is you're not successful. And the dynamics will never change, regardless of those instances. The first instance, when you do hit the target and your attention was on the target more than any other element of, of the smoothie, but you didn't break wholeness. The second situation scenario is your attention was on the target because that's, that's your default state, but you didn't hit the target. You were way off. Ricky Fowler was way off, dead left, amateur shot. And he knew it as soon as he swung. Uh, par three, get it close. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of these guys. Uh, you know, who, who's Matt, Matt Wolf? Come on, he's never, you know, whatever, all right? So what happens is the target starts pulsating to enough of a level on the surface that it disrupts the smoothie. It's no longer a smoothie. You could see more of the outline of the target in that smoothie than anything else. So in the first instance, when he defaulted to what he normally does, which is um, put his attention on the target, it did act as a tuning fork to create more wholeness. And it acted as a tuning fork to when he is becoming specific and specificity is there, specificity is there, but putting his attention on that somehow allows wholeness still to be experienced at a threshold level. That's how I would answer that question. Cool. You know, it's funny. It's funny. You just made me think, Stephen, for a second. As you're describing that, I think about the great architects who are able to use targets to disrupt wholeness. 
you know, like a Pete Dye 17 Sawgrass kind of idea, right? Where you've got that sort of targeting that's like disrupting wholeness because it's so intense. And to, to speak to your point, right? And then I guess the great athletes armed with a good caddy would be able to step aside and become more abstract in their view of the target, less concrete, you know, and it therefore could, could remain whole and use it more as a tuning fork. Uh, anyway, just thinking as a, as, a, as a coach there for a second and also just picturing the architecture that's, that's feasting on this, the, the way the mind works, right? At yeah. least the good ones. No, exactly, exactly. And, and the thing is, is that a good architect will not give you the most comfortable look uh, yeah. on the course, all right? He wants to challenge you. Exactly, you know, to disrupt wholeness. To disrupt it, because if there's, he doesn't know what really, you know, the dynamics of this, okay? But mm -hmm. if I, you know, sat down with a Pete Dye or, you know, uh, Mackenzie, whatever, these mm -hmm. great architects, even Jack, all right, designed some great courses, Greg Norman, um, and um, explain, intuitively they know yeah. that there's not going to be much of a challenge if someone's hitting the ball 260 and 270 and there's not some kind of a sand trap or, or something, a tree, you know, something to disrupt yeah. th that kind of thing. Otherwise, the game comes too easy. Boom. You know, there's no sand trap in front of the green. Um, there's no danger in back of the green. Something to disrupt. So I think it's a very, it's a very insightful point, John. Yeah, interesting. Well, okay, well, thank you for clearing that up. That had just been gnawing at me a little bit because I am a very target-oriented coach, if you know what I mean. But I, I, I also love the tuning fork idea, and I think I can sense and the transcendent idea. That idea of like this allows us to plug into the wholeness. And for some of us, maybe the very strong visual types, let's say, uh, that's exactly how we access the wholeness a little bit easier than, for instance, muttering the word nines or whatever. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know what? Here's the thing. I, I have not come up with every single road to Rome, okay? Yeah. You, you use your own road, but you have to get to Rome. And you have to understand what Rome is, okay? What am I really trying to do? Because I'm telling you, I've asked some of the best golfers in the world, do they really understand what happens when they play well? And they say, no, I do not understand. Because they don't understand the processes in the mind that allowed them to swing so well that day. So, okay, anyone else, James? Um, Stephen, kind of, kind of following a little bit on the idea uh, that John mentioned um, about being target oriented, or as you mentioned, Steve, Stephen, just a few minutes ago about about Tiger thinking about a particular movement with his hands or or something prior to making his shot. Is it possible that his thought on moving his hands in a specific way or um, triggers the triggers the wholeness or 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 maybe or may or maybe kind of following a little bit what tom mentioned of the acceptance of acceptance of of uh of the result kind of a bit of mental stuff there but that kind of might go along with with tiger in the sense that maybe he moves his on a particular shot he has a huge repertoire but on a particular shot he wants to do something very specific which could be very concrete. Oh, very concrete. For, for, for some people, for some people, but it could be maybe, maybe a bit, maybe a bit of a sensation that he gets, which could be very abstract. Yes, yes, for and sure. And that might guide the process. Yes, for sure that's true. And I think that uh, different players could have different, different tools for, for that represent their tuning fork, okay? That, that somehow, what it is, is that that tuning fork mixes the ingredients in the algorithm um, so that there's real wholeness there, okay? And it could be specific for some people, get your hands like this. It could be a feeling for some people. I wanna feel like that, but those feelings, you gotta be careful with those feelings because if you start chasing those feelings and you start making it the star of the show, just like you start making, you know, getting my right hand through that putt, like you said, when he won the Masters, then you're going to break wholeness. Now, yeah. I'm sorry about that. So, it, so it's just, there's the subtlety there that what, you, that what you're mentioning is it's uh, James? 
John, are you there? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Okay, so we, we lost James. It, it yeah. is extremely subtle. This whole thing is subtle. It is, I mean, it, sorry about that. I lost the connection for a bit of a second. Is the subtlety is there's, there's a very subtle amount of the sensation or the feeling that kind of guides it, but yes. when you but when you make it the focus of I have to move my hand this way, we, we it interact it, it disrupts the wholeness. So it's, so so there's a very small amount, a very small amount that kind of puts it to get that that just gives you the trigger to go towards the wholeness. Yes, you have a very very small window to operate. Wow. On that level. I mean, extraordinarily small, okay. very, uh, and it's, it, it's not going to change. And only the great ones are able really to consistently get into that window. Now, guys, hold on one second. I'm about to run, run out of juice on this. I have to go upstairs, get a, uh, a device where I can uh, speak to you and still charge the battery. So I'm going to let you all go for one second. Hopefully, um, if you get disconnected, um, dial back in, in in like a minute, okay? Cool. All right, hold on. Because I have to tell you, I have to tell you this great Jack Nicholas story. John. Hey, James. Hi, how are you doing? Are, so I'm are, you, are you, um, you mentioned a little bit about target focused. Yes. And excuse my ignorance on that because I'm more of a, I mean, the, the, the way I've been, te I've been doing some teaching and I, I, I did um, a master's in sports psych and that type of thing. You're a sports psychologist, is that right? No, not by trade, just, uh, just by pragmatics through golf. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Because kind of the, which is maybe a little bit, a bit different than what, you, what your approach is, is an approach that I had the opportunity of spending some time with Michael Hebron yes. out in New York. And his, yep. his, a lot of his theories and his books and all of that goes really into the aspect of learning. Yep. of the lie with the experience we have right now the lie and you guys there For, do way more harm than good and therefore the target became a nice substitute almost like a tuning fork almost like a, a an illusion that allowed us to get away from mechanics cool yeah so thanks, that's kind of where i go with it thanks for explaining the idea no problem thanks james thank you okay i'm back so i have to tell you um i didn't include it, this jack nicholas story in um in this book i did in my in my my other book but you know, who took longer over a putt than Jack Nicholas in his prime? It's like, come on already, pull the trigger. What are you waiting for, right? I mean, it was almost painful sometimes to watch him putt. Am I right or wrong? You're thinking because the experience that you have had or your students have had is the longer you stand over that ball, every second that ticks by is you're decreasing your chances of either making the putt or, or, or putting a good move on a ball, right? Are we all, we're all on the same page, right? Okay. So I, I started thinking about it and I said, well, what's going on here? All right. Based on my understanding of um, how to produce fluid motion. Is he reminding himself of the DNA goal? No, I don't think so. He's a smart player. He knows what the putt is going to do. He knows the speed in the line. Is he trying to really focus in 
on making the putt, it did, that didn't make sense to me either, okay? So what is he doing? What, what is he doing? And again, unless you speak to Jack Nicholas, you won't know whether what I'm saying is true or not. But so I'm just hypothesizing more or less, okay? What he was doing, he was waiting for his mind to settle down to that very, very soft space in the transcendent where he knew that his hands were going to be soft, he was going to be able to control the putter head as far as speed is concerned. And he essentially he was waiting to experience more wholeness in the gap. That that that's the way I would understand it. And and sometimes sometimes to experience more wholeness in the gap, you have to wait for it. Because if you pull the trigger before you have a threshold level of wholeness in the gap, is Vegas baby okay you're not too sure whether you're going to be able to control the speed on that putt so um, he knew I mean Jack his whole career lived in that space there is no way that you could be a uh, one of the greatest if not the greatest golfer of all time and not have that space as your default state so he's waiting he's waiting I don't feel it yet Wholeness has not been established. Of course, in a million years, he's not going to use that terminology. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Smoothie. Boom. So that would be my interpretation of, of the importance of the gap. I just sent you guys a, uh, a, a chapter on the gap, okay, uh, for, for Nicholas or for anybody. So anyway, I thought, I thought you might enjoy hearing that story. And I guess, Stephen, would you then it just read your chapter on the gap? Would, 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 and there's three moments of gap, let's say, in the motion of golf, which is before, after, and middle, which is interesting. In the middle, have you, uh, do you think, that, do you think that, a, that a strong, transcendent-oriented player would be able to manage himself and wait to change directions until they've experienced wholeness in the gap? Is that really what's happening at the top of our swing? No, or it's, it's, just too, no. it's just too quick, yeah. I, I, I know that's a cr silly question in a sense that you couldn't possibly answer, of course, but, but at the same time, I'm wondering what your instinct is there. Well, my instinct is that, I mean, the transition, and I think I wrote I, in another chapter, um, you may not have gotten that, is so crucial because anytime motion stops for a split second, the cerebellum is doing two things. One, it's evaluating how you got there and what situation you are being there. And two, it's, it's what's going to happen in a split second with the unfolding of the motion. So it's reviewing and then preparing. And it has to review and prepare. It has to, because this, this is just the nature of the beast, in a state of abstraction and wholeness. It has to. and. Um, I, I tell you how subtle this is um, in, a, in a, an analogy in tennis, okay? Um, there's there's two, gap, two gaps in tennis. One is very obvious. You're waiting for the ball. You hit the ball. You're not in motion after that unless you're running. But you're not preparing to hit another ball because you don't know what ball you're going to hit, what, what the condition of the ball is. So there's that obvious gap of hitting a ball and waiting. And then there's another micro gap that I, that I discovered last year that I, that, I, that I found very fascinating. And that micro gap is there comes a point when the ball is coming towards you, your opponent hit a shot, and you have determined, you have acknowledged that it's going to be a forehand or a backhand. You just acknowledge it. You haven't started any motion yet. There's a point where you know, and it may not be exactly when it crosses the net, maybe just after it crosses the net, or you could pick it up before it crosses the net, but you acknowledge that, okay, the next shot that I hit is going to be a forehand. Now, there's a gap. It's infinitesimal, infinitesimally small. There's a gap between when you initiate the motion and you acknowledge that it was a forehand. 
It's not an instant kind of thing. You first have to acknowledge it, right? Now, and then you prepare because if you don't know it's coming to your forehand, how can you prepare to hit a forehand? It's a completely different sequence of events, preparing to hit a forehand versus preparing to hit a backhand. So there's this momentary infinitesimal paw uh, acknowledgement, and then you initiate the motion. So between that acknowledgement and between initiating the motion, the cerebellum is processing what needs to take place in order for you to hit a successful forehand. It's input, it, it's, it's programming the computer, and it does it like this, it's, it's instant, okay? It's like when someone throws a ball to you, it's as soon as you acknowledge, now you don't know whether it's coming to your right side or your left side, but as soon as you acknowledge that it's coming to your, to your right side, there's just a, a almost infinitesimal pause, even though you would have to use one of these cameras, you know, high-speed cameras, and then what the cerebellum does automatically, it computes where your hand has to be to catch the ball. So in that, when, when the cerebellum is computing that, it's, it's programming you. It's like the ATM machine. You, you put your ATM, your, your card in, okay, you punch your, you put your pin in, $20. Now, as soon as you hit the $20, then the, le the, then the levers immediately move. So in the transition, it's such a crucial space for the processes in the mind to acknowledge how you got there, okay? What are you when you are there? And then to program the computer for you to access your muscle memory, make any adjustments, because if you're way outside or your hands are too high or too low or whatever, and it feels you're gonna to be too shallow or too steep, the cerebellum is preparing to make the adjustments outside of what your normal def default swing is. So that transition, you can't really, I mean, you can try to do something like set one, but you know, under the gun, that's gonna be very difficult. So, and, and in all the fluid cues, as you know, intention is more important than execution. So yeah, just, go ahead. Sorry, t uh, Tim Galway really liked that idea, right? At the top, back, and then hit, and then stop. You know, so if you say back, you've distracted yourself one monitor. And so if you can time the word back at the top of your swing and then say hit around impact and then stop at the end, then theoretically the cerebellum would be allowed to do its work in self two mode. Is that it? Right, so. Uh, it, well, intergame of tennis and, and originally, and then intergame of golf as his next version of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I love Tim Galway. And I love, obviously, his book, you know, uh, just opened up a whole new field of understanding. Yeah. And it's interesting that Galway's book came out in 70 when I had my zone experiences. And I read it. And I didn't have the knowledge that I have now, that I have now, not even close. But intuitively, it didn't feel very powerful, um, the technique that he came up with. The understanding, brilliant. Essentially, the whole book is access the inner intelligence, in, inner intelligence exactly. theology and let it. Yeah. He, lots he, of parallels. Lots of parallels. He was yeah. the first one to use inner intelligence. I'm not the first one, okay? I'm yeah. way down the road. Uh, the inner intelligence of, of the body, all right? He was giving tennis lessons that I can relate. As soon as he stopped talking and, and said, uh, let yeah. that person figure it out, then the cerebellum started operating correctly because wholeness was established. But this thing of, you know, hit, uh, bounce, hit, bounce, hit, it doesn't work. I mean, he's not even in sports, he's in business. Yeah. yeah. If, it, if it was so powerful in sports, now again, he's influenced a lot of, a lot, a lot of athletes, okay? What's his name at the Seattle so Seahawks? Who's, who's the coach? At Pete Carroll, Pete Carroll and Michael Gervais, yeah. Pete Carroll had everyone read the inner game of tennis, okay? Yeah. And other, same thing. But what it does, it gives the framework. It doesn't give the technique. Yeah. It, it, creates a, it creates a readership for you, at least, which is good. And then right. now you can, yeah, exactly. So in my opinion, okay, this starts where he left off. That I'm building on his, on, on his foundation. But it's not his foundation. It's nature, okay? This is how nature works. But uh, because, and again, and... This program could only have been developed if I 
had access to these deeper levels of the mind through 45 years of meditation, transcendental meditation. There's no way that someone could sit down and intellectually, intellectually come up with what I came up with. You, it's impossible. For, and that's why no one has ever done it. And I, you know, I, I, I'm humbled by the power of the mind only because I've accessed deeper levels of the mind. So I tell people, and I, and I tell them many times when they're going through my program, this is not my program, okay? This is your program. I did not come up with how fluid motion is produced or how the cerebellum works or how the loops can be broken. This is, this is science, this is nature. We're just giving you some, some I don't wanna say tricks, I'll say techniques to access that, but it's your birthright. The mind, the mind wants to default to quieter states during motion. It wants to default. It was not designed by the creator to create motion from the surface level of the mind. That's when you take a calculus problem, or that's when you solve a calculus problem, you're taking your LSATs or whatever. So, um, but I love Galway. It was brilliant. Yeah, and I didn't mean I didn't mean to pull you aside there necessarily. Although I I have to sign up presently. Uh, sign up presently, Stephen. It's been very nice to meet you guys, James. Thanks for the com comments as well. Um, but this this moment in the top of the swing, Stephen. It's I call it the gathering, where where we prepare to change directions. Um, yeah, and and I thought uh, I might pick that up with you next Monday if that's okay, or or in our next uh, opportunity. Please, I'd love to talk about it and hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you very much for your openness again there, Stephen. I've really enjoyed reading along with your text and, and getting to know you a little bit. So thanks very much. Thank Have you. a great day, guys. Yeah. yeah. So um, anybody else would like yeah, to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there real quick on the target. Yes, Tom. So we talk about target and uh, my feeling on target is it's always there. You can't neglect it. It's We always have a target. So it's like, if you asked yourself, we'll try and forget it, you couldn't forget it. Because by trying to forget it, you're actually bringing it to, to the forefront. All right, so basically the question I try and have people do, the, the system that I work at is, I ask the question of, there's our target. What skill do you possess that could get you to that target? Is it gonna be a high shot, a low shot? You're gonna take two shots to get there, three shots to get there? How many shots are you going to take to get there? So the target on the par four is around the corner, around the bend, you can see the pin. So you have to have the skill or the, the, the mentality to say, what do I possess that can get me to that point? And you have to be honest with yourself. So another thing would be, I think um, one of the chapters you could build in here, and maybe you've already done it, is the, the, the trait of honesty uh, being completely honest with yourself. In other words, if you lay up on a par five, most of the time you hit a great shot because there is less uh, tension and less thought of getting it to the ultimate goal. So it's almost like, how do I sneak up on this thing based on the skills that I now possess? And you take a tiger, he possesses a skill, nothing's in his way. Matty Wolf, nothing's in their way. So they possess these skills. So there has to be an, a, a result in skill building that allows you to think the way you need to think right. to get to the target. So as he was talking about hitting that stop sign and that, and the diaper, it was almost as if it was a given. He had the weight of the, I mean, he just tossed it or he tossed a snowball, but there was no importance derived from it. So in other words, it wasn't important that he hit the stop sign. It wasn't a golf shot that was going to cost him a double or triple bogey. So there was, there was less riding on it. Yes. So it's always a, what is riding on it? Do I possess the skill necessary to hit this particular shot? And if I don't, can I be honest with myself that if I try and hit it out of my character, out of my uh, ability, I'll most likely interfere with it. Yes. I think that uh, it's a deep insight. It's an excellent insight, Tom the importance, you know, and I, I always go back to the second ball syndrome. It's such a good example because the dynamics that happen on that second ball is exactly the dynamics, which you just mentioned, laying up on a par five. Okay. Always, you know, always swinging. Well, the importance of the shot. Well, it's not that important. I mean, I, I'm just getting it out there somewhere, right? I just have to get it out there. So I, you know, have a wedge into the green. So, um, and honesty, you know, 
I'll leave that to the sports psychologist, okay? I, I, <laughs> I'm more interested in that 1.5 seconds. And of course, honesty could play a role in that, but um, I, um, it, 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 it's more- I, 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 Well, not even think about it, it's honesty, but just real. So you know, do we live in a real world? Are yeah. you in the real world right now? Are you in a fantasy world? Yeah. One yeah. more thing before I need to go. My yeah. dad was a policeman for 35 years. He was involved in some investigations in, in, in that part of it, in the sense he was. Yeah. And he was, he was not a college man. He grew up and he was a very educated man. And he always said to me, he said, remember, he said, the answers are always in the gaps. Okay, the answers are always in the gaps of your thinking. And he said, he gave me an example. So one of the examples he gave me, if you had a suspect that did something and you suspected that they had committed some crime, stealing something or doing something, he said, all you had to do was listen to them. And he said, the person that was most believable is the person that was one to blurted out and couldn't take a breath. And they would just get it all out. They would just bop, 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 bop. And he said, the people that you had to worry about were the ones who took pauses and gaps because they were trying to, calibrate what they were about to say, how they were about to say it, and how they should couch it to you to make it believable to you and to make it, but he said, you would actually have to tell the believable people to slow down because they were just blurting it out from the deepness of their body. They weren't trying to conceive anything new or reconstruct it in any way. That is a very, that's, well, that's a real life example, okay? That's a great story. Right. He said they would, they would blurt it out. And he said, you just listen to him and you just, just listen to him. And he said, you can tell when somebody isn't lying by just the way they talk and the way they're trying to get it out. And, and they'll even admit to doing some things wrong or whatever, because they just want to get it out. Yeah. And they just, and the other people are calculating. Right. Right. So in that, in that they, uh, gaps are not that good. Okay. You don't want gaps. You just want to get the whole thing out. Right. Yeah, they would try and control you or control the situation. Right, right. Well, I think this was a really good session. I think that um, some really good points came out. And uh, um, keep reading. And uh, there'll be another chapter coming down the line in a day or two. And uh, I think we'll just meet on uh, next Monday. And again, if you have any questions, you know, please let me know. I've well, next Monday's Memorial Day. Do you still want to do that? Why not? Okay. I yeah, I mean, should I not? Should we do it another day? What do, what do you That's think? That's fine with me. I can do it. No. Every day is the same for me, including. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. guys. Have a good yeah. week. Have a good week, Stephen. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.